Okay, uh, so I'm going to redo the, or hopefully redo the session that I did last year during the Create Camp, um, which means that I, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to have the code that I'm writing open on my other monitor so I don't have to like write it live during the thing, but I'm going to go back through and I guess rewrite this module from scratch, um, which is, where did I put it? Okay, so uh, I need to open this in Sublime. Do I have an invoke here? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, so frequently the advantage to using Lua over Cargo, or sorry, using Lua over Wikitext with stuff like Cargo um, and pretty much any scenario that you have where you have like a bunch of data that you have to display in a way is that it lets you have variables. Uh, in in MediaWiki, variables are pretty annoying to deal with. Um, and you can't have like easily have data structures. And if you want to have something persist for a while, then you end up having weird control structures where everything is a global and you're modifying the same thing from like seven different files. And Cargo wants you to have a template that you use in one place. And then you have another template that you have to call from somewhere else. And suddenly like seven different templates need to know about the same variable. They're all on different pages you have to open all of them if you want to make some change. And because everything's a global variable, you have you don't have the ability to scope stuff. You don't have the ability to make sure that you're not taking advantage of an inner scoped variable later than you should be. So if you change something about that, you have no idea what's going on. Um, and it just ends up being a mess. So in particular, that means that Lua is not very good for extremely simple things because if these issues aren't actually issues, there's not really any need to fix these issues. Um, so if you just want to have like a regular cargo table that you do a query and then you display a bunch of rows, being able to have scoped variables and stuff isn't really going to do you much good. So, um, so the example that I chose for this last year to have as the uh, example of something that we're going to do in Lua that makes sense to do in Lua is uh, to display a, a table that has row spans. And why are row spans hard in regular MediaWiki? Um, because you need to count something. Because when you start the row, you need to give it the row span attribute. And you have like, you have kind of two choices. The first choice is to use ver final, and the second choice is to like store all of your information into variables or arrays or whatever you want and then only once you're done do you declare the row and both of those really suck so if you want to show a table that from a cargo query that has a row span that is really not easy to do in regular wiki text and you're going to end up with very very confusing things that uh that no one can really follow um, so before I go, so this is going to be our goal. You don't have to know anything about cargo to be able to follow this. Um, just there are cats that we're adopting or we're, we're running an animal shelter and we're adopting cats. They're, they're very cute cats. Um, I, last year when I wrote this, I Googled cat names and then I took the four most common cat names and put it into my data table. Um, so before we do that, we'll take a quick look at, this is just, so if you've never written Lua before, um, so basically anytime you start with a new language, there's gonna be some random boilerplate format that you copy paste into every single program that you write, or every single module that you write. And you don't really have to know, oh, actually, sorry, just to interrupt myself really quickly. Can someone read chat? and then interrupt me if anyone has a question so that I don't have to watch chat, but 
That what way anyone that? can drop. Yeah. Okay. So if you want me to stop or like clarify anything, then write in either Riot chat or whatever Cindy wants to pay attention to, and then Cindy will interrupt me so that I can answer the question. Because that's good. And there was a, there was already a request on the Lua classroom room on Riot for the link to your tutorial, which I put in there. So. Oh. Okay. Um. Yeah. So. So. I think Vincent told me it was blocked at NASA because so, <laughs> it's on Gamepedia.com. So he was trying to read this, and you can't load Gamepedia. So hopefully that's not an issue for too many people trying to refer to this in a workplace. So I'm, I'm sorry that I work for a video game company. <laughs> um, OK, so yeah, so Hello World um, pretty much so Depending on uh, depending on your wiki, you might already have something in place for this, or you can just copy from Wikipedia. There's some random magic that you should not attempt to figure out in the slightest. That that I, I mean, I can explain it to anyone who's interested, but it's like it's really not worth learning early on because it's kind of complicated and irrelevant for the most part. Um, so you have this thing called the frame object, which is going to be the argument of your main function. And you can magically extract all of the arguments from your magical frame object. And on Wikipedia, and you can just copy from Wikipedia um, the arguments module. And I guess they use, uh, they use get args. So literally just copy paste this from Wikipedia when you're writing your first module. Um, and I guess I'll post that in the Lua classroom. Right. Hey, Megan, I'm, I'm thinking it might help some people if you increase the font size a little bit. Right. That's always an issue. Okay. I'll have to do it like per site. No um, but yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll try and do 150%. Um, yeah. So, so this is just, complete magic don't worry about how it works and this is probably actually a better thing to copy paste in my hello world so this is this is what you should copy paste when you write your first little function and then you can say like return hello world here uh or i guess i'm getting an argument called kittens from the invoke and then printing it here um so get args is a magic function that does magic stuff P is P stands for package, and that's the thing that you return at the end. So when you write all of your code, MediaWiki needs to be able to figure out what code you wrote, and so you have to return something to it. And what you return is a table containing all of your functions. So saying local P is an empty table, and then saying P dot main is a function here, that would be the same as OK, now I need to have Sublime open so I can type. Um, okay. And I'll zoom in here, too. OK, so that would be the same as saying, uh, so you can uh, do it like that. So you're actually just returning a table of functions at the end. Um, a convention that I like to do is uh, I have this H table, and H for me stands for helper, and I put all of my helper functions into H, and that allows me to call functions before I define them, because that's just the order I like to write stuff in. But then I want P to be relatively free, so I want that, or like free of uh, random clutter, I guess. So I want that to only contain the main function. So I put everything else into H, and this stuff into P, um, you don't have to do that. If you don't want to, you can just put everything in P or whatever. Um, so one thing that you should avoid is you shouldn't do something like this. Um, uh, so now you've just made kittens into a global and generally globals are not good. So you wanna put that into, into some table of functions. Um, pretty much everything in Lua is a table. So if you're used to um, JSONs, where you can have like, uh, you can have 
an array or you can have a dictionary in Lua. It's, it's all the same. You, you, you can put, um, so like, So that's that's allowed to happen except for else as a keyword. So there we go. Um, so this is an allowed object, uh, and this is you can totally do something like this. So these are ordered parameters, and then you can have named parameters in the same table uh, in the same object as your ordered parameters. Um, and then I guess one last thing before I start actually writing code is that I. Uh, the way that you iterate over tables is that if you have, if you want to get all of the key value pairs, then you use pairs. Um, and if you want to get only the ordered pairs, you do I pairs. And when you, I guess, when you read the documentation, you should look out for these two keywords. And I won't go into too much detail right now uh, about how, like what they when you would use them, I guess, but pairs is all elements of a table, and then I pairs is only the array, the ordered numbered elements of a table. So um, I guess so far, what you should have taken away is that this is kind of the boilerplate code that you will copy, and you don't need to worry about what it does. And uh, tables are basically everything in the way. You put functions into tables and you return a table to MediaWiki. And the main advantage that Lua has over MediaWiki is the ability to make tables of information and manipulate them. So you'll be doing that all the time if you're using Lua. And if you're not doing that, then it's maybe not even worth it to bother with Lua for that particular program. And uh, when you're working with tables, for the most part, everything is going to center around calling pairs or I pairs on a table and then doing something with the value. So I'm going to stop for a sec. And in that like TLDR, does everyone feel like I actually covered all of those things? And you feel like you know it, or you feel like you maybe kind of have an idea of what you might be doing if you tried to write a little module that just like prints Hello World or something. The other situation I very often use Lua in is when I find myself doing really um, basically programming in wiki text, having large blocks of you know parser functions and the like, and um, for first of all, it's very unreadable. Second of all, it can be a pain trying to match up braces, and you know you need a real programming language. But also the other key part is that um, if you wanted to make your code readable in wiki text you'd have to act add a lot of spaces and those spaces will be rendered in the rendering of the page. And so you would wind up with, um, you know, even if your parser function does not itself admit something by putting spaces around it, you wind up with large blocks of spaces that where that code was. And so putting stuff into a Lua module allows you to use good coding conventions and, and um, space things out nicely so that your code is readable and not worry about. So I really like separating the rendering in the actual wiki text of the page, whereas the, you know, business logic is in a little module. Okay, so is everyone good? And I, yeah, I don't see any other comments. Thank you for talking because that let me open the page I needed to open in Sublime because I definitely <laughs> opened the wrong page before. <laughs> um, delayed just as long enough. Yeah, yeah, because I copy pasted including module and then I also typed module and I'm like, what is this page? Okay, whatever, I'm just going to go with it. But yeah, okay. Um, so I'm going to open a new page. And this is also a plug for how awesome Media Wicker is, by the way. Um, Okay, so I have a module open now on my wiki called Cats Adopted 2 because last year I created Cats Adopted. And then off screen, I have all of the code that I'm going to write. So I get to cheat. I think last year I actually did this live and didn't have any like runtime errors, which is amazing. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to start out by just copying a couple things that I don't want to type out, and it's not important. Um, okay, so to define the scope of the problem that we want to do is that we are tracking when cats were adopted. And what we want to do is print an ordered list for all the days in the week that have all of the uh, cats that were adopted on that day. And we want to make something very pretty to use in a report about how the adoption center is going. So we want to make uh, call spans like this. Or sorry, we want to make row spans like this. Um, what did I call this cargo table? Oh, I called it this. Okay, so this is what our data looks like. You don't have, to, if you've never used cargo before, don't worry about it. Um, just pretend that we have, I mean, we do have this data in a table that has all of the cats that were adopted. Um, so it looks like on Friday, there was one cat adopted. On Monday, there was one. On Saturday, there were three, et cetera, throughout the week. Um, and so we can query this using cargo, which I will absolutely glance, gloss over and not talk about in depth. I did that enough yesterday. Um, and we'll end up with an object in our module that has all of this data in it. And then once we have that object, we're going to just print it into a table. So one issue is that, as you can see here, the days are ordered alphabetically. And we don't want to do that. We want to order our days by actual day of the week. So we're going to tell, there's there's two ways uh, that we could tell our module which way to order the days. And you can either, and so again, there's these there's two ways that you can use tables. So this is an array where this is the same as saying like one is Sunday, two is Monday. Um, the Because it's given without a key, the order is just implied. So key three is Tuesday. Um, and just a quick word of caution, the, like this, um, that's not the same as having, a, as, as this, um, you can have a string, which is an integer or like a string representation of an integer. And that's different from the integer. So sometimes in particular working with, uh, getting arguments from wiki text, if an, if a user puts in three or something, you'll receive the string three and not the integer three. So a common pitfall is to accidentally think that you have an integer, but you actually have a string representation of an integer. Um, and so converting between integer or number um, and string, you have two string and two integer, or sorry, two number. Um, these are both built into the language and so you can use both of them. And you will often have to make use of, of these two, especially if you use cargo. Um, but it, just if you're taking any input from anywhere. Uh, so this is having an array. And then the second way, which is makes it a little bit easier to do, is that this way we can say, OK, what's the day of the week? Um, it's Friday. So now let's look up Friday in this table. And that says 6. So when we sort our data later, um, we can just look up the day in this table and then do the order based on the values that we get back. So does the, does the idea of the two types of tables make sense? And also do you think you understand how we, or I guess why we would want this to be able to sort the table the way we want it? Or does anyone not understand that? Makes So, um, so like I said, normally uh, we're going to start out with a main function. Um, so, oh, and then uh, one thing that you might have noticed, um, one thing that you might have noticed here is that I wrote uh, util args gets require module args util. And if you look at Wikipedia, um, they put a function here also. So if, so when you have this from Wikipedia, um, then you would call this with like get args. 
but for mine, um, you, I, I'm append, I'm telling it what index the function is at later when I call it, and in the Wikipedia version, they only import the one function instead of importing the entire module and having everything available. I have a lot of random utilities in utilargs, so I like to import the entire module instead of one single function. Um, my convention is that if I'm importing a single function, I give it a capital letter. If I'm importing an entire table of functions, then I give it a lowercase first letter. Um, so having conventions like that can help, but I guess don't, don't be thrown off by these two different ways of importing one where you import a single function and one where you just import a table of functions and then you have to say which function you're calling inside your main code. Um, so here uh, I create a table of functions, I put nothing in it and then I return P. I could put this, I could save this and then I could invoke it and it wouldn't throw any error. It, or I guess I couldn't invoke it because I don't have a, a function to, to invoke yet. Um, but there's, I guess there's nothing wrong with this right now. I could import it into another module with require and I wouldn't get any kind of error because it does exist. It is returning something. It's just returning an empty table, which is really useless. Really useless. Um, so the first thing that you do is define a main function. I use main if I'm calling something from wiki text. So generally any, any one module should only have one function that's callable from wiki text, except in extreme circumstances where if you want to have like two different methods of doing the same thing, um, I might do like p dot from cargo and p dot from args. If I'm allowing myself to call data either, if I'm allowing myself to get data from either the user input or from the database, then I might do two functions like this. Um, but then I would just like return So I basically these two would be just acquiring data in different ways and then immediately executing another main function um, or another another function which I would call main underscore because it's not called directly from uh, from media working anymore. So barring situations like this, you should only have one function per module that's callable from wiki text. And this is, I guess, an anti pattern that I see a lot is people having more than one function that can be called from wiki text. And you should definitely not do that. Um, unless again, it's like this where it's basically just the same code except being run in being wrapped in two different ways of getting data. Um, it can get really confusing when you have really large module files and you end up having stuff that's scoped throughout the entire module being available in too many places and it's, it's just not a good idea. So you typically want to have literally only one function in, in P and that's going to be uh, p.main. So So like I was saying, this is the boilerplate. You don't need to know what this does. It's just going to give you some args. It's going to give you a table because everything in Lua is a table. Um, so you have a table of data from your arguments or a table of arguments from your arguments, whatever. Um, and I'm going to just delete this because it's taking up too much space. Um, so, so far we're not doing anything, but now we do have something that will actually not produce an error if we invoke this right now. We could save it and it'll just do nothing. Um, so let's have the module actually do something. So typically I like to write the main function first and I try to have main functions be a general rule of thumb is less than about 10 lines. Uh, and then it should basically just be telling what the flow of control is from other functions or between other functions. Um, so I'm not going to actually write anything that's doing anything yet, but I'm going to write what we're going to do. Um, so like I said, I like to put a non-wiki, non-called from wiki text 
it's really hard to type and talk at the same time. Wow. Okay. Um, I like to put other functions into a separate table so that they're not exported in the package. Um, so I'm just going to create H as a helper table of functions. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to construct and run a query. And that's, I'm actually just going to copy paste that because I don't want to go too much into the cargo part of it. But that's going to give me the information about the cats that we're adopting. and then I will do the rest of the logic. Um, so then once you have, so there's, you can treat your, so uh, I guess there, there's, there's an argument to be made that once you have your table of arguments from the user, you should never edit that because you want that table to always reflect exactly what inputs that you were given. And similarly, you could have the idea that you don't like to ever edit um, the data that you get from your query. Uh, so when I wrote this last year, I I was of that opinion that those once they're once they've been created, they're just read only for the rest. And I don't really feel that way anymore. I prefer to edit stuff in place for the most part. Um, so I guess I'm going to change this a little bit in uh, because I, I I don't do that anymore. So um, then I'm going to say. Uh, So I'm going to edit data in place. So you might notice that I didn't actually assign anything to this. That's because when you have an object that you pass to a function, you can edit it in place. And then all of the things that you've done um, to it in that function are still applied to it. So that's not true for a constant. Like if I said, um, So if I did something terrible like this, then uh, then I'd still be returning cute. I wouldn't be returning not cute because this is just a constant. And so constants are not passed as references, but objects are. So um, since this is data, uh, so now, so now when I'm returning this, um, it does actually remember that I've assigned not cute. Um, so yeah, so TLDR, we don't actually need to assign anything here because um, this will be saved in data. And then at the end, I'm going to return h.make output of data. Um, I reuse these function names constantly. Um, normally, I actually just call this function process data, but that's not a great name. But because I have a global convention of always doing it, it's kind of okay. Um, you should try and make conventions for how you name things as early as possible. So for example, for me, the word print always means to append additional nodes to an mw.html object. You don't have to really know what that means, but the point is that if a function is called print something, then it you know what it's doing. If it's called make something, then it's always instantiating an mw.html element and then returning it. If it's called um, init something, then it'll be instantiating an HTML element that's incomplete and has to have stuff printed to it later. Um, so I have a bunch of conventions about what verbs mean. And it means that, um, so one of the disadvantages of Lua as a language is that you lose a lot of structure because it's not naturally object oriented. And so by just having a bunch of conventions like this, you get a lot of needed structure that you would have if you were using a different language. And because Lua doesn't provide the structure for you, it's pretty important to provide it for you or to provide it for yourself. So I'm going to put a huge caveat with like, it would be really, really, really difficult if tomorrow you wrote your very first Lua module, but prior to doing that, you had to write a whole style guide for everything, and you had to make sure that all of your functions were named properly and flow of control was always very clear and everything made 100% sense. That's obviously not going to happen. And if you tried to make that happen, I'd say you're wasting your time because you need to just write code. So 
it's way more important when you're starting to just write a ton of code and then this can happen over time. But I think you should always have a goal of trying to make better global conventions as you go and also have an ingrained philosophy of continuous refactoring of old code that you wrote. So there shouldn't ever be such a thing on your wiki as a module that just never gets changed ever again, unless it's something that you imported from Wikipedia or something. You should always be open to the idea of going back and editing code that you wrote before. And that's not just low advice, that's just advice in general when you're writing code. Um, the best way to make sure that your code is changeable is to change it constantly. And it's, I guess um, I would say that the, the number two most important thing of code is that it works. And the number one most important thing of code is that it's easy to change. Because if it doesn't work, but it's easy to change, no problem, you can just fix it. It's so easy to change. But if it is hard to change, one day I guarantee it's gonna stop working because your requirements are gonna change. Your, what you need to show is gonna change. Maybe people are adopting puppies instead of kittens. I don't know why they do that, but maybe they are. Um, and then suddenly you have to change all of your code. And since it's hard to change, then that just guarantees it's broken forever once the need to change happens. So always optimize for having code easy to change first and working second. Um, and again, like sometimes, it's you just have to make something work. But then once you if you have the philosophy of constant refactoring, you'll basically be forced to make your code easy to change um, and write a lot of comments. But don't write too many comments. Great. Um, so we're not actually going to say something as terrible as kittens aren't cute. So um, I'm going to cheat and copy paste this. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to pass args here just so that in the future, if I wanted to change my query so that it had it used information from args, I could do that, but I'm not doing that right now. So args is just passed here as an unnecessary parameter, but that's something that makes it easier to change later. And then I'm just going to collapse this and we're never going to think about it again. So uh, what have we actually gotten from this? Um, so what, what we receive from make and run query is going to be a, a data structure that looks like this. Um, it's a table. So I'm actually going to, instead of calling it data, I'm going to uh, that was not good. Still not good. Um, There we go. Um, so query result is going to have an, a bunch of rows and each row is going to correspond and it's an, it's an ordered list. So th this is like one equals two equals, etc. cetera. Um, but those are just implicitly there if I write it the other way. So it's going to have a cat name and it's going to have a day of the week that the cat was adopted. And if we look back at our data table, we can see that these are the two, um, columns here and I guess I aliased name is or I aliased cat name. Oh, I didn't. I'm still calling it cat name. Okay. This is actually called cat name. Um, so the data here from our cargo table is going to just be magically given to us as an as an array here with all of these uh, rows of data. Um, so does everyone under, or I guess, does anyone not understand the, the idea of the format that this data is going to be returned in? And do you think you could like, like, do you have a solid conceptual understanding of this data structure? I don't care if you know why we're getting it like that, but if I just promise you that we are getting it like that, does it make sense? Yay, okay, so I'm gonna, um, so I, I'm like really thrown off by how big all of the text is. 
Um, so I'm going to scroll a lot. But so keep the structure in mind because that's what we're going to be passed here um, when we want to process our Megan, data. Hmm? One quick question from the chat um, uh, from Vince. Uh, we are grouping by day, correct? OK, no. We are going to later group by day, but we're not adding a group by to the cargo query. Um, because so if we if we added a group by day to the cargo query or here, I guess probably people who know cargo actually want to see this. So I shouldn't have hidden that. Um, you saw cargo query and cast yesterday when I was talking about cargo, I mentioned that you should always, always, always make your own personal wrapper for cargo. So this is my own personal wrapper for cargo that does a bunch of magic. Um, I don't act, I, part of my wrapper says the automatic limit to max, so this isn't needed for my wrapper, whatever. Um, but yeah, there's no group by here because if we did do a group by, then I wouldn't actually get all the individual cat names. Um, and part of the reason this is so difficult to do from wiki text is that it's one of the things that Cargo does not do particularly well is support one-to-many relations to be queried from wiki text. So one-to-many is like each day has multiple cat names that were adopted that day. So we have like Saturday, there's a bunch of rows here for Saturday and a bunch of rows here for Sunday. And so if we were just going to do a normal query from Cargo, we would get literally this table that has Saturday, Jack, Saturday, Max, Saturday, Milo, and is it Milo? I don't know. Um, and we wouldn't be able to do like Saturday Jack comma Max because they they just doesn't support that. So I actually wrote a module that attempts to let you do easy one to many querying um, from Wiki Text by just invoking my module instead of invoking car instead of doing a cargo query directly. But I'm not going to talk too much about that right now because the point is to learn how to do in Lua. Um, but if we were going to do a group by, then we would get the what we would get returned is that we would have one row for Saturday, and then it would just pick one random cat, and then one row for Sunday, and it picks a random cat here. Um, if we did an if we had an order, then I think it would pick the first cat alphabetically, but maybe it would pick the last cat, cat alphabetically, and that's actually dependent on what SQL you're using. So if you're using MySQL, it might be different from if you're using whatever other uh, database. So group by pretty much when you're doing a group by the only two things that are okay to query are one values that are the same in the group by. So um, like the Saturday will always give you Saturday because that's true for every single row in the group by by definition of the group by. Um, and the second one is aggregate uh, fields. So if we wanted to do like a table that was Saturday 3, Sunday 3, Thursday 2, that would be fine because again, when you do like count star or count distinct star or whatever, that that doesn't have to like pick one at random and show you, it just shows you the aggregate. So again, when you're doing a group by, only fields that are the same in every row of the group by or aggregate values of the group by. Um, and if you want to do one to many handling, then you should not be using any kind of group by, but then you should be doing the logic in Lua to quote unquote group by later. Hey, Megan. Hi. One more question. This one's for me, but um, in Cargo, you can do something along the lines of merge similar cells equals yes to produce somewhat similar results. Is that right? I had never heard of that, really. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've done it. I mean, I can do kind of like the cat thing that you're oh. talking about. Wait, that's cool. OK, well, let's pretend you can't do that, because if you wanted to do something slightly more complicated, it probably wouldn't support it. Um, yeah, and it breaks down sometimes the way you kind of want to do it, especially if multiple columns you want sorted in a certain way. You have to kind of do it by order, and then it does some weird things. Right. 
And then also, okay, so maybe I guess I could change this example slightly so that you want to do an ordered list instead of doing a row span. Um, and because if you want to do an ordered list of the cats, or just like a comma separated list rather of the cats inside of the cell, then you wouldn't be able to do that. So maybe maybe I'll change what you want so that uh, so that it's actually not supported. But yeah, let's let's pretend that functionality doesn't exist. I had no idea you could do that. It's actually I I know very little about using cargo with wiki text because I have not done it in years. Um, okay, so we're going to. I'm just going to keep the example the same so that I don't have to like write significantly different code from what's on my other screen in front of me. Um, so, oh, I know I, okay, I'm going to, I know I made a different object here. I'm actually going to assign a variable here. Okay. Uh, that's not what I'm going to do. Okay, and then I'll just start. Okay, so we're going to go back to the idea of wanting to do a row span here because um, I think that's a better example. So what we need to end up with is each row is going, so each row of our output data is going to be a day of the week not a row of the table. So it's somewhat frustrating that row has these two different meanings. So I always say TR for table row and row for data table. And I always name my variables like that. So row means a row of data table, TR means a table row. And I'm going to try and use those conventions also while I'm talking today. And I recommend you do the same conventions because otherwise it is so unbelievably confusing because row means two completely unrelated things. And also, this week I was working on some code for cargo and the two meanings of table were like driving me crazy. And so I renamed all of the wiki table to wiki table and then there was some sanity restored. So whenever you have like two words that mean, or whenever you have one word that has two just different meanings in your code, rename one of them so that that doesn't happen because it is very, very confusing. So each row of our data table is going to correspond to multiple TRs of the table and of the wiki table. Um, and so we're going to want to have day of the week is Sunday. And here's the full list of cats. So we're actually going to have to have a table within each row of all of the cats because we need to, we need to print them all. And we also need to know how many of them are there are so that we can do the correct wristband in our um, day of the week cell. So what we, this means what this means that we need to do is reorganize our entire data that we got from cargo. So remember, it looks like this right now. And we need to make something that looks like this. Yay, copy pasting. Um, so I like to call this an ordered dictionary because that's effectively what it is. Um, so we have these ordered uh, ordered elements of the table. So again, this is one, two, three. And then Sunday is also a key of its own data table. So um, here we're going to have a list of cats. So uh, whatever cats are in, I don't think these are the Sunday cats. Um, so there's going to be a list of cat names here, and that's going to be the cats for the day. And this will make it easier later when we want to iterate through everything and pull all the information together. Um, we will be able to just look at the list of cats according to day instead of doing the parsing later. So a, a, another rule of thumb where it's going to be this caveat where I say, well, don't worry about it when you're starting, but is that you never, ever, ever want to do logic at the same time as printing something. So printing, when we have this make output, we should not have to do any more data processing at all. 
Um, maybe we get the length of this table so that we can do the correct row span, but ideally we wouldn't even have to do that. Ideally we would even have like, um, this would look something like our, something like this, um, where we have the row span already computed and the cat names already listed here. And maybe I'll do that structure instead because that's just slightly better. Um, so make output should not have to know anything about our data. It should just be given something, excuse me, it should be given something that's completely processed and all it has to know about is how to print tables of already computed data. So what we could do is we could like go through the table that we got here and for each row, we could like change the data somewhat and also append it to our output object and we could like do these things at the same time, but it'd just be really confusing. And the whole point of Lua is to make things not confusing. So we want to separate these two into two, um, we want to separate these two phases. And sometimes you might need to like, first you get your data and then you add some markup to your data and then you group your data and then you combine your data with other data and each of these would be an extra row in the main function. But the idea is that you want to really, really separate out the different phases of what you're doing so that make output definitely does not overlap with process data for printing in any way. So, um, The most common error that I get when I write Lua modules is that something is nil because I forgot to return a value. I don't know, if, Cindy, does that happen to you also? Or is that just me? No, it happens to me too. <laughs> Constantly. It's yeah. literally my most frequent. It's so common yeah. that at this point, I'm, I actually am really good at debugging it because it's my first guess anytime anything doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. where, where did I forget to return something? Um, so I would encourage you to, whenever you're doing something where you initialize an object and then return it, I would encourage you to write these two lines first. But I will also caution you that you are never, ever, ever going to remember to write these two lines first. And whenever something's not working, the first thing you should check for is, wait, did I remember to return anything? And the answer is probably you forgot to return anything. Actually, you'll probably have a lot of random errors at, 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 the, at, the, at the start, and that's expected and normal and don't, don't be sad if you have constant errors, but one day when you've written enough code, this will probably be your most common error is that you just forgot to return something. Uh, but we're not, that's not gonna be an issue because we, uh, we're returning this here. I'm sure I'm still gonna make the same mistake somewhere else, even though I have the code on my other screen in front of me. Okay, so before I mentioned how pairs and ipairs are these really helpful functions. If you know Python, uh, it's like enumerate. Um, if you know PHP, it's like when you have the for each and you put a key with an arrow before the value so that you get both the index and the value uh, for every row that you're doing something. Um, and I don't actually know how you do that in JavaScript, but that language sucks, so I don't care. Uh, so I'm just gonna, I've given up trying to type and talk at the same time. So I'm just gonna be a bit of silence while I'm talking. Um, so again, and this is something that I actually do all the time because the syntax highlight reminds me too, but when you start a block of code, like an if or a for, just write the end and then write the stuff in between. Um, this is not an error. Like you're allowed to have an empty uh, loop like this. And in fact, there is no equivalent of the pass keyword in Lua. So if I want, if I want like if a then else and and like actual logic here. Sometimes I want to write something like this and it drives me crazy. So I just write pass with a comment, but like this is valid code. It's okay if there's, that's not true in all languages, um, but it's okay to have like an empty block of code. So, and also that means that like, if you had like, a lot of statements here um, and it doesn't work, you can just comment it out and that's okay to do, to have this be empty when you're trying to debug. Um, okay, so we're going to 
uh, in each row, we want to do two things. Um, yeah, okay, we want to do two things. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to check and see, is this a new day? So if it is a new day, then we want to initiate the, or initialize the day in our process data. And if it's not a new day, then we want to append the cat to day. So, um, so index is always going to be an integer, one, two, three, et cetera. And row is going to be a table that has two values. One is cat name and the other is day. And my convention is that anything that's coming from cargo is going to have a capital. It's going to be written in camel case with a capital first letter. And if it's not from cargo, I use camel case with a lower first, a lowercase first letter. So um, you can make whatever convention you want, but it's nice to have some kind of convention. Um, and if you want to copy mine, you can do that because it's the best because it's what I do. Um, but yeah, so that so if I'm like looking at data later and I'm like, oh, how did cat name get there? Was that a user input? Was that a computed field? Was that from cargo? If it starts with a capital C, I know it's from cargo. And so that's just a lot. Like that's that's why I used here. I have these lowercase um, lowercase C, lowercase R, and then here it's capital. That's like 100% deliberate and completely by design. Um, so some people use lowercase field names in cargo, and I disagree with that very strongly. I think you should capitalize the first letter of, uh, of tables and field names. Um, so anyway, so you might have kind of noticed that um, if I write like row.cat name, that's going to give me the index. Um, you can also write like, like this, where you have the actual index is written out as a string inside of brackets, which makes it a little, so this is like in Python, you have to do fields like this uh, always. And in like JavaScript, you can also do row.cat name. Uh, when, I, when you're starting out, I would suggest doing it more like this first syntax because uh, it's just a little bit clearer, I guess. And I wrote it, I wrote all of my um, row indices like this for a really long time um, until I started doing it like this. But I will say that having a, having a good syntax highlighter helps a lot because you can notice that this is green because it knows that it's uh, a key. And then if I put parentheses here, it would turn it to pink because now it's a function. So being able to just glance at my screen and see that um, and see that the index here is green. And so I know it's a string key in my table. Um, syntax highlighting really, really helps with a lot. And the syntax highlighting that you can get in your browser, the absolute best syntax highlighting you can get in your browser is still really, really terrible compared to using um, an actual ID or Sublime text. So another reason to use MediaWiker is that Sublime's Lua code definition is actually amazing. They pushed an update in June last year and it had a lot of bugs and I reported a lot of them and they fixed them all. And so it's great now. And I actually really love how, okay, so if I like remove the comment here, it knows that these indices are strings and it's just everything is so good. This is so much better than the old Lua syntax definition. So also if you're using Sublime and you haven't upgraded to, I think 3.3, you should do that because they made Lua awesome. Um, okay, so I guess I talked for a lot of time now. Does anyone, is anyone confused about anything or want me to go back to a topic or slow down? I have one general question. How do you normally debug and kind of build your code? Um, are you, you know, typing a little bit and then going and invoking it and checking it? Um, so I, okay, so what I generally do is I will write like the minimum viable product of something that I can run and get output. And once I've done that and I've debugged it, 
then I start adding one feature at a time. I'm like, all right, so now I need to format this cell. And it's kind of like TDD, test-driven development, except for I'm not doing tests. I'm doing it live in production. <laughs> um, and so I'm like, all right, this is the next thing I'm going to do. And then I do that. And I tab between, I alt tab between um, whatever page in my username space that I have open with the invoke and Sublime where I'm editing. And I, so when I'm writing a new module, I'll probably save it anywhere 50 to 100 times in the first like five hours because I'm constantly resaving. Um, and I think it's very valuable to do a little tiny piece of code at a time so that when it stops working, you know precisely what you edited to make it stop working. Um, and then there's also, because saving it to the wiki commits the version, um, you also have a much more robust robust version history. So you're not scared about losing previous revisions if you broke something and then had to press Control-Z and you don't know how long to press Control-Z. So I, for a long time, I've wanted to try like actual test-driven development, but that is very difficult to do in this environment because you're making, like, you have to make all of your outputs are HTML outputs and I don't know. I, it's something I want to try, but it just seems like very annoying and just like pseudo test driven development of like decide one feature, code it, preview the page again, code the next feature, preview the page again. Uh, it works pretty well for me. Sometimes I'm like, this is a really straightforward, simple thing. I'm just going to write all 200 lines of code and then I'm going to test it. And every now and then I really regret doing that, but I've done enough coding at this point that you, sometimes it's okay. So uh, I wouldn't say that like it's required to always use this process, but it's, I, think it's, I think it works well, especially when you still don't feel super confident about what you're doing. But that's also another case where it would be like significantly more annoying to do if you're actually coding in the browser because then you have to like click another button to go back to edit and then you lost your vertical location where you were in the text and like that just sounds awful. And then the alternative is to like physically copy paste between your browser and another text editor, which I did for like months before I discovered Sublime. And then sometimes you copy paste the wrong module and then you take your entire wiki down because you copied into a crucial module that's used on every single page and it's just completely not what's, ex what's expected to be there now. So then I wrote an abuse filter where the first line of every single module was a commented name of that module. And if the module didn't have that commented name of the module as the first line, then it would just refuse to save. So I, that got rid of the like saving over the wrong thing, but that's like ridiculous and also still really inconvenient, especially when you're trying to like code two lines at a time and you should definitely, definitely, definitely use Media Wicker. You have me convinced. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I just need to find time one of these days to install it. But I can it, help that's you. Amazing. I there can you help you. And I have to say your abuse filter suggestion is just brilliant. A lot it's of your suggestions. So bad. It's so bad. Oh my god. And then I like had to and then I when I took the abuse filter offline and then now I'm doing everything in Media Wicker, I just see all of these comments and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> I have all these yes. comments and things that I have to delete now. So, <laughs> that is fun. Bless it. Hey, Megan, you have somebody else in the chats that uh, you may have convinced and they're interested in wondering uh, the best documentation or site to install MediaWicker? Um, I would use package control, so oh, I don't have an alias for that. Um, OK, so first you want to install Sublime. And I'm going to be like, brutally honest, that is probably going to be about a month or two before you have any idea what you're doing in Sublime because this the learning curve of this program is terrible. But it's okay. And you can also just spam me on Riot Chat or Twitter or wherever you want to, um, to for help configuring it because I, I love this 
add on so much and I want everyone to use it. So I'm super happy to help people out with getting set up with it. Um, so the first thing that you do when you install Sublime is that uh, you want to in then install package control. And if you just search like, I search a lot of Sublime things. Um, so yeah, I guess, so I'll post this in uh, the little classroom chat in Riot. Um, so just follow the instructions here to get package control. And then once you have package control, uh, you can press control shift P and then start typing install package. And then you press enter here and then it loads everything slowly and it's not going to show media wicker because I already have it installed, but you can just, um, it would come up if I didn't have it installed yet. Um, there's probably like 10 or so different add-ons that you need to make Sublime actually be nice. Um, and maybe maybe that'll be my next blog post will be a list of like add-ons that I think you should have in Sublime if you're editing Lua modules uh, in MediaWiki. That would be most awesome. But okay, yeah, I'll do that. There's, I use a lot of add-ons. Um, and I also use, I try to use one syntax highlight per language so that, and it, it works pretty well of making me like, I don't accidentally type Python code when I'm trying to code in Lua, et cetera. Um, so I recommend doing that, but then managing having all of these syntax highlights is very annoying. But yesterday I discovered a new add-on that lets you preview syntax highlights in your current language only, and it is so good. So I'm really excited about that. Sublime is the best. Um, but yeah, definitely package control and then install media wicker. And I have like a lot of packages. This is probably about half of my packages. This is the package that I found yesterday. Um, yeah, and then you can do stuff like, uh, there's one that when you press control T lets you jump between all of the open modules that you have. Um, I usually have four windows of Sublime open and each one has like anywhere from five to 30 open modules in it. So yeah. Okay, so any other questions? Not in chat right now. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of this because that was just for example. And then, so uh, what I'm gonna do is something that I typically would not bother doing, but um, it's probably a good idea because it makes stuff easier to read early on, like early on when you're coding in Lua. Um, Oh my gosh. Okay, so I'm just gonna alias day and cat like this, um, just so that the following expressions are a little bit easier to read. Um, so, um, I said I was going to be like copy pasting, but I'm actually not copy pasting because I don't like how I did it last time. So I'm just writing code. So I'm, I'll probably have some mistakes. Um, okay, so after aliasing um, J and cat to be these two uh, things, and I could like say this right, because J is just an alias for row.cat or row.day. And again, I, everything is declared as local. So you always need to remember to make stuff local because like I was saying at the start, one of the huge advantages of Lua is that you get scoping for all of your variables instead of using the variables extension and everything is global to your entire page. So you really wanna take advantage of, um, of the ability to have scoping like this and don't ever make any global objects unless it's constant and even then you probably still don't want to. Um, so 
if we haven't seen the day yet, then we need to make an empty day. So because there's seven days in a week, we could have just like, when we did this, we could have said like Sunday. We could have done this if we wanted to. Um, and then we wouldn't have to check here in this row. But what if there is a day when no cats are adopted? All oh, that would be so sad. Um, but for real, when you're doing a random example, it's very likely that you won't actually know the entire potential set of keys ahead of time. So you probably do, you, you will very, very frequently write code that is very, very similar to this, where if something isn't initialized yet, then we initialize it. And then we work with what the initialized thing is. So this basically lets, so having these three lines lets us for the rest of this loop, assume that, um, assume that process state of day exists because if it didn't, then we just created it here. So I'm gonna say that one more time slightly differently. Um, if, you, if you try and use this, this expression, process data of day, before day actually exists as an index in process data, then this expression is just gonna be undefined. It's not gonna exist. It's not gonna throw an error. So in Python, for example, this would throw an error if it wasn't defined yet. Um, in Lua, this is just nil. So uh, this is a true statement that uh, process data of day equals nil. Um, but if we tried to do like, if we tried to append another key, so cat name, and remember that's the same as saying cat name like this, that is an error because you're not allowed to get the index of something that's nil. So you're allowed to have something that's nil, but you're not allowed to get the index of something that's nil. So we do need to create this table to start out so that we can do stuff to it later, but we're only going to do that if it's not already defined. And then it, you'll, you'll notice here that we're actually taking advantage of the fact that this does not error in Lua. It would be slightly better, whoops, it would be slightly better to say um, if this explicitly equals nil, because another thing that we could say is like, let that be false, and then it exists, but it's not true. So in that case, when it's false, this evaluates to true, and this does exist. Um, so this is like kind of lazy syntax that you should really check for explicit equality to nil, but I don't do that. And I probably never will. And that's probably a really bad habit that I don't recommend that you have, but I hate explicitly checking for nil. And I instead, I'm very careful to not have things be false very often. Um, so we now have a guarantee that our day, and remember our day is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it's gonna be a string like that. Uh, so we know that that exists in our table. And my, Okay. Why am I, not? okay, so. Okay, so you'll remember that the, this is the, the data structure that we're trying to build and it's this ordered dictionary. And so actually, we need to do two things with each day. The first thing we need to do is put it into our uh, into our list of days, which is in order. And then we need to also give it this uh, table value here so that we can loop through an order and then look at the value of each day based on the order here. So you might say, oh, well, how do we know it's in order in this for loop here uh, if we're just doing things in the order of the data. I didn't put an order by here. And the answer is we, we don't. And that's deliberate so that I can show you how table.sort works later. <laughs> um, but in actual code, you would probably want to use SQL to do the ordering and you would put an order by whatever. Um, but we're not going to do that. So we, we do not, in fact, know if these day, days are being added in order. And that is by design for the purposes of illustration. Um, oh, my code did do that. I just, I, I see. Yeah, okay. 
So, um, so do you understand why we're like what this entire block of code does? And do you think that this is something that you could reproduce in a similar situation? Or does anyone not? understand it or I guess does anyone think that you would benefit from me saying more things about this okay yay um, so now we know that this exists and uh, oh I okay someone should have said that they didn't understand this because I didn't explain this yet okay so this is a pen this is how a pen works and you're like, what? There's no append method in Lua? There's no append method in Lua. You, so remember how I said that it doesn't, it does not error to call a key that doesn't exist yet. So the length of the table plus one is a key that does not exist yet. And we can just assign data that. So that's how we append something in Lua to a table. <laughs> Yay. Um, I actually wrote a function called append that I use if it's a very complicated expression because sometimes it'll be like, I'll find an actual example. Oh, I called it push, didn't I? So like if I wanted to write something like this, I, are you are you actually kidding me? I'm I'm not writing this shit. So I wrote a um I wrote a function that does that for you. So Lua has like not very many standard library functions, and so a trend that you will notice over time is you write probably hundreds of standard library functions for yourself. And that's really not OK, but it's OK, I guess. I, yeah. Um, anyway, so if you, have, if you have trouble writing this out for a very complicated thing, um, it's OK to Oops. It's okay to write a function that's literally this. And that's like a common theme in general for, well, I guess for coding in general, but also for coding in Lua, is that like a lot of functions are very, very, very simple, like insanely simple. Like this is literally all that it does. There's one line of code here, but this is one of the most helpful functions I've ever written because the cases when I would need to use it just look terrible when they're written in the main body code. And I don't like that. So if you think that writing a one-line function to use as a utility function is going to make your life easier, you can totally do that. There is no rule that says that like, oh, functions all, like in, in English class, every paragraph has to have five sentences. There's, no, you can have functions be as short as you want. So uh, feel free to write very, very short utility functions that do very few things and then use them constantly. And it'll have the side effect of people who aren't you will have no idea what all of these functions all over the place do, which is also not good. So you should also document it very, very carefully and make that documentation very visible. Like, for example, having a comment here, but then also having like a full list of every function that's available um, is nice to have, which I don't, but yeah. Um, anyway, so that's how, what, uh, so number means length. So the length of the table plus one and assign date to that. And a lot of things in Lua work like this where you just have something that is nil and it's okay to have a nil uh, value in a table. Um, incidentally, the way that you delete something, so if I wanted to say like, so if I have like process data dot Sunday and I want to do it for everything except for Sunday, so at the end I want to say delete Sunday, you don't actually delete, you just say like gets nil. 
so the value of every key that's not in the table is nil. Um, nil is the same as undefined in JavaScript. Um, it's it's not false. It both nil and false evaluate to false, but nil is nothing, whereas false is actually a value. Um, so okay. So now that we have uh, now that we know that we have a table of information for this day. Um, so now this is going to be a list of cat names. So. And now you can see how this syntax is kind of annoying. So uh, that is that is not set up like this. Um, that's set up the way I originally did it with like um, but I guess I'm gonna do that for now because it's a little bit simpler. Um, well, it's not it's it, it's simpler to write out here, I guess. Um, okay. So now what I have is a dictionary, an ordered dictionary, remember, where I have all of these, these um, days that are not necessarily in order yet. And then I have the list of cats in this format um, as the values for everything. So there is a function called table.sort. And when we did this day order better here thing, um, this is our implementation of the order of the days of the week. So uh, so if I wanted to do, if I put like a less than or a greater than, uh, it'll do a comparison between the strings and it'll sort it in alphabetical order, reverse alphabetical order. I can never remember which is which. I just pick one and then see if it was right. And approximately half the time it is. Um, so sorry, one sec. Okay, my voice is dying. Um, so instead of sorting by greater than or less than, we actually want to make a custom function, which you can do, and we're going to do that now. So I'm going to make a function called compare day order. And so you might notice that what I wrote here is that doesn't look like a function. So there's a function here with an open parenthesis, but where's the parentheses for this function? And the answer is that they're, they're inside of table.sort. So and I want to copy paste this because it's a long line. So when you put the parentheses after a function, that's when you execute it. And we actually, we don't want to execute day, compare day order and then pass that into sort. We want sort to actually have the function and we want sort to be able to call the function. So, um, and this is similar, get args as a function here and then when we did this assignment um, to get args, there's no parentheses here, even though get args is a function. And that's because we wanted to store the function into get args and not the value of the function into get args. Then we can call get args later on because this is a function and now we're actually evaluating it and storing that into args. So similarly, we're not evaluating compared day order here we're actually sending the function to table.sort and table.sort will do the evaluation as it needs to. And um, when you're writing a custom sort function uh, for table.sort, it takes two values and these are the two values in the table that it's going to compare to each other and then it's going to order based on the result. So you need to return either true or false. And in it, so, um, this might make a little bit more sense if I said like if then return true, else return false. And um, so this is what we're this is what we want to do. We want to say if the first order is before the second order, then return true, 
And this is another thing where I never remember, are, are you supposed to do it? Is it supposed to be true if it's less than, or is it supposed to be true if it's greater than? And I just, I never remember. So I guess it's supposed to be true if it's less than, and I will always just do it once. Ah, oh, shit, I did everything in the wrong order. And then I change the true and false output of whatever my sort function is, and then everything is good. Um, so, so that said, this expression is going to evaluate to either true or false. So I can say if true, then return true, else return false. But if true isn't true, then this expression means false. So this expression is itself a Boolean. And so I can just return it because this comparison is either true or false. And so you don't need to do this. So this is another case where um, if you're confused by the idea of returning an expression like that, feel free to write code like this. Um, but you don't need to. You can just return the value. So that's what we're going to do here. Um, so then this will sort in order. And because I copy paste it from last year, I know I got the less than right. Yay. Um, so just to recap what this function does is first it goes through all of the rows. Uh, and then you'll notice that index isn't used here. So um, underscore is, uh, is a valid variable name. You can call something underscore. By convention, and this isn't my convention, this is like a global convention, and it's not even just a Lua convention, it's just a convention in general. If you need to assign a parameter, but you're not gonna use it, you assign it to underscore. And then people are like, all right, I don't need to know what that is because it's underscore. Um, so we don't care about the index right now. So we're, for each row, we're gonna extract the day and the cat, and then we're going to initialize our ordered dictionary for this day if we haven't done that already. And then we're going to push the cat into the day, and then we're going to sort. So again, I'm using this format and not this format, even though this format is probably slightly better. It's more work. Um, so we have an order dictionary using the second format here. And that is what we are now going to return from process data for printing. So uh, is there any part of that that you want me to go over again? Okay, also I guess I should ask, because we're now at twice the amount of allocated time for this, I think. Um, does anyone like need to go soon and I should speed up or am I going in a good pace? Actually, I think we scheduled it. It was scheduled from 2 to 3.30, so you're right at the limit right now. Okay. And in 30 minutes, we have the closing session, so it's really up to everybody whether, you know, I, I, I think it's fine for you to keep going if you're good doing that and um, we'll just wrap I, up if my 30. voice doesn't die i'm good cool and then we'll just go straight into the closing session at four okay and then i guess a follow-up to that um am i going like too slowly because i i don't know i'm trying to go pretty slowly but am i overdoing it i don't think so it's not too slow for me okay am i going too quickly I think it's about right. I mean, there's some things I'm I'm going to need to revisit myself anyway, but I'm getting concept. Okay. We will have this up. We'll have the video up so people can go and watch it three, four times. Just one way. Yeah, and <laughs> as, as, as long as as long as Gamepedia isn't blocked at your place of work, which I guess everyone's working from home, so that doesn't even matter. Yay! But they, but they can at least they can at least watch the video on YouTube because the video yeah. will be uploaded to YouTube, so they'll be good. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll end up saving this to the wiki so you can see this year's versus last year's. They're very similar. Um, Brian, Brian had mentioned that on um, mwstake.org, there's a copy of some of this, I think. Did I understand that right, Brian? And maybe it would be a good idea to move the tutorial there so that it wouldn't be blocked. Oh yeah, I could do that. Yeah, I didn't, you know, I just basically found your source and copied it over. So a lot of the, um, modules that you're invoking, you know, aren't going to work, but uh, a lot of the stuff that the user might need to copy and paste to get this to go. Uh, okay. Yeah. There's, there's somewhat of a caveat asterisk thing here with all of this, which is that 
My cargo util module requires like seven other utility modules and then they in turn require a bunch of other stuff and probably to like actually make this code run on another wiki you need to copy at least 10 random utility modules. Um, I was not exaggerating when I said hundreds of like quote unquote standard library functions because nothing is built in. Um, every now and then I will write a function and then like months later I'll be like, oh, that that is built in. And then I'm like, <laughs> I just don't care. I'm not, I'm not going through and changing all of this that I've been doing for so many years. Um, so it's very difficult to copy code from my wiki because of this. But if I intend code to be copied, I try very hard to not use very many utility functions. But I didn't want to, I very purposely wanted to hide args and hide cargo. So that's why I have these requires here. Um, but I guess in some sense, it doesn't matter if the thing actually runs because uh, uh, you just need to see the code. OK, so we're going to make output now. Yay. Um, oh, I need this. OK, so what is the first thing that I will? OK, so I'm going to say local output. What is the ne very next thing that I should do in this function? I have no idea, but I'd guess the two things are always supposed You cut out a bit. Brian, you cut out. Uh, I, I, had a random guess. I had a random guess. It probably wasn't right. Um, so for it. OK, I'm going to return this at the end. Yay. <laughs> um, so I have another convention that output is always the thing that I'm outputting. And so you would think if I have something that's output, I would always remember to turn it. And you would be totally wrong. I never remember to turn output. So uh, so this is like the boilerplate code for make output is to make output and you initialize an mw.html builder and then you return output. Um, so I also use, I use TBL for table uh, for a media wiki table. Um, so an alternative way to do this um, would be that I could just have output be table. Uh, so I could say like, um, I could just do like this and then comment this or any of that and then return, I commented the wrong thing. Um, so I could do it like this uh, and where I'm creating the table and then I'm making a wiki table and I'm returning it. I don't like to do this because then, oh, in three days, I realize I need to add a caption to it. And then I'm like, OK, well, now I'm changing it back to output.create. And then I'm doing this. And then I'm like, output wiki text make caption. Um, and I have done this exact thing so very many times that I just expect it to happen for now. And I never actually put an object here. I always just instantiate an empty mw.html object, and then I tag it, and then I return it. Um, so because we only have 30 minutes left, or 20 minutes left, I guess, I am going to completely gloss over how mw.html actually works. Uh, normally or I guess if we if I, if I had like two hours left, I would spend a lot of time talking about how cool it is and why you should always use it. Um, and I'm also going to just, uh, whoops. Okay, uh, and then I'm also going to copy this over. So basically, so this is a pretty typical output function. I create an output object. I give it a table. I add a wiki table class, and then uh, I call this process data. Um, and then I'm really not doing anything here. All, all I'm doing is saying is I'm promising you that I'm going to print a day. And in fact, if I was doing this using all of my random library functions, I would just say like util map dot safe. Um, and I would uh, 
I would call this. Just kidding. Um, and so that would that would basically just execute this, um, but it's like less lines of code. So the point is that similar to the main function, make output is generally very short, and you delegate stuff as much as possible. Um, So uh, to print a day, so um, by convention, the HTML object that I'm building to is always the very first thing that I pass to any uh, to any function that's printing. Oh, my cat came into my room. Hi, cat. Maybe you'll hear her meow, but I don't think she's hungry. Um, so uh, the two things that I need to Right, the two things I need to send are the list of cats, which again, this is an order dictionary. So this is um, this is the list, just the list of cats, and this is the day uh, of the week. So this is going to be, so day is a string. There's no, you can't do like type annotations in Lua, which is very annoying. Um, so I often try to put the type of a variable into its name, which generally is not a thing that's recommended to do anymore, but that's only because languages usually have things like type annotations and Lua does not. So it can be very valuable to include the type. So I could say like a day string, um, our cat's table here. Uh, and then it would be like very obvious and totally feel free to do stuff like this where you actually encode the type of the object into the object's name. Um, even if you like read coding best practices advice, and it says don't do that anymore. Um, in Lua, it makes a lot of sense to do that. Um, so, okay, I'm like starting to feel time pressure. So maybe I should just copy paste code and then explain it. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll keep typing. And if I get to when I get to 10 minutes, I'll copy paste the rest. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is create a new row, a new TR, so a new table row. Um, and then remember that I have a list of cats here and a day. I want to... <coughs> oh, okay. Excuse um, me. Okay. Um, just, just one question. Didn't we need to return the table instead of the output, actually? Oh, that's actually a really good question. And the answer is no. Um, so uh, the HTML object is uh, a series of, um, like, you can think of it like Russian nesting dolls, a series of nesting containers of HTML data. And so the, where, so the output holds a table, and now we're making the table hold a bunch of TRs, and then we're going to make the TR hold a bunch of TDs, etc. And um, there's a method, the two string method puts the entire object to a string for output. Um, and that's implicitly called when we return it. So we don't have to, so we could do like two string like this. Um, but we don't have to because it's implicitly done when we return something to wiki text. But anyway, uh, that encodes both the current object plus all of its children into wiki text. So we want to return the outermost object that we created. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, if we had more time, I would also talk a little bit more about where you are in the object. But just remember that what we're doing here with table, we're not like, don't think of this as creating a table. Think of this as aliasing a place aliasing a location in the output table. So, or I guess creating a node in the output table and aliasing it. So we've added a table node to output and we're aliasing it as TBL. Here we're adding a TR node to TBL and we're aliasing it as TR. So TR is just a location inside of table, inside of output. Um, it's not its own separate object. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna want to uh, we're going to want to print the name of the day. Uh, 
Um, remember, the row span is the uh, the length of list of cats, and the number pound sign uh, is the length. Um, and then the information that we're going to need in order to print this is the uh, the row that we're going to print to and the day. So now I'm going to write this function quickly. Uh, often when you're writing a function, if I call the function, then I'll copy paste that to create the function and then change stuff to actually be variables. Um, and then here we're going to tag, we're going to make a TD, a uh, table data cell. Uh, so we're making a table data with the day as the wiki text and the row span as the row span. It's pretty straightforward. That's just what we want to do. And we're doing it for the current row. Um, and then we also want to, okay, so now we're in a slightly awkward position because we need to now do two different things depending where we are in the list of cats. If we're on the first cat, then we want to um, we want to print this in the same row. And if we're on the second or later cat, then we want to print it in a new cat in a new row, right? So I'll show the table again so that. You can see. So Sunday is in this row, and then Luna is also in this row, but then Chloe is in its own row. So we need to do two different things depending if it's the first one on the table or not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say okay, so I'm taking out the first thing in the list of cats and I'm giving it the variable name first cat. And then I'm going to say print cat of the first cat. How do we print a cat? It's even easier than printing the day name. Again, this is cat. Um, we just make a table data and then we add wiki text cat. Okay, so now I need to print the rest of the cats. I'm just going to overwrite the variable tr. Um, okay, so for the first cat, we reuse this table row. And then for the rest of the cats, which is the things that are left over in list of cats after you remove the first thing. By the way, Lua is one indexed. Lua being one indexed is great because MediaWiki is also when indexed. So the indexing of our scripting language matches the index of our environment, and that is great. And that's why we should not put JavaScript into Scribunto. Um, or I won't use it if we do do that. I don't like JavaScript. Um, so if anyone tells you zero indexing is better than one indexing, tell them it's more important to maintain parity with your uh, with the context that you're coding in. And it would be it's, it's very, very convenient that there is one indexed for this reason. Anyway, uh, if you didn't understand that, it's totally OK. One index means that uh, the first index in an array is 1. And zero index means that the first array in an index is 0. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. And most developers agree that zero indexing is nicer. Um, but Definitely one indexing is really, really nice because it matches MediaWiki. Um, so we remove the first cat. And it's actually possible that there is only one cat in the week. And if that's the case, then uh, list of cats is now going to be an empty list. And that's OK. If list of cats is empty, it'll just skip this code. Um, so if I need this nil, that's an error. But 
if this is the empty set, that's not an error. That's totally allowed. So we don't have to check if list of cats is, is not empty now. Um, and so then for each cat, we print the cat. It turns out that the logic to print one cat is exactly the same, regardless of if we're doing it in the same row as the day of the week or if we're doing it in a later row. So we just print the cat. And we should be done. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. Um, you should always add some kind of uh, summary when you save something. And let's see if I wrote this right. Oh, it's called Cats Adopted too. Okay, so there's some error here, which is great because I can show you how to debug, yay. As definitely, absolutely deliberate. Um, so we click the error and then it says, okay, the most recent error was in uh, line 58 in function process data for printing. Um, and it means this, we're, we're sending a nil value to iPair, so I probably have some typo or something. Um, yeah, because this is called query result. I renamed stuff from last year. Um, so now we preview again. And there's a list of cats! Yay, we did it! Um, so now what we could do, so normally, um, so now I'm just saving this as a sandbox page in my username space. Uh, oh, and I don't have care inserts on this wiki. Oh, I don't have anything on this wiki. So. I can't believe I'm taking this out. Right, so now I have a temp. Oh my gosh, don't do that. Okay, so now if I want to do this, I can just say call the template. And then the list of cats is printed. So we did it. Yay! Yay that's beautiful. Congratulations. Very nice. <laughs> Yeah, very nice. So, so yeah, just uh, pretend that this is not possible in Cargo, and you have seen how Lua can make something that could have been done in wiki text in a very annoying way into a not super annoying way. Um, and it's 100 lines of codes, or 100 lines of code, but most of it is like there's a bunch of comments here and stuff. Um, so yeah, so this is like, and this is a pretty reasonably close to an actual real life scenario that you might want to do. Um, so let's um, let's pretend that or let's change it a little bit, I guess. Um, so I'm gonna delete the row span. Um, and I'm gonna get rid of this. Okay, so if we changed the requirements of the project slightly and we said, okay, so we don't actually wanna do a row span. We wanna do a comma separated list of cats in each row. And the reason that we wanna do this is so that it's actually a, program, a problem that Cargo can't easily solve with a built-in function unless there's another one that I don't know about. Um, so, we actually don't need this either. Um, so we're gonna make our table row, we're gonna print the day name, and then we're gonna say print list of cats, tr list of cats. We don't need the call span here, or the row span here anymore, so I'm gonna delete that from this function also. So now we have very slightly, we've, so notice that I did not change anything before make output. And in fact, I didn't even change anything in make output. All I changed stuff was print day. So print day, 
print a name, and print list of cats. So these are the only three functions that I changed. Everything else is completely static. And I've significantly changed the output. So if you wanted to have an ordered list of cats inside of the day, you can do that instead. And actually, this was significantly easier to do that because we didn't have to do the special case for the first cat nonsense that we had to do for um, when, we, when we did it with the wristband version. But this is, so this is like, imagine if you were doing this in wiki text and you were asked first to do it with the rose band and then they were like, oh, just kidding, this takes up too much vertical space. We want to do it in line with a comma separated list. That would be like such a nightmare to redo, but in Lua, we just changed three functions and really those three functions could have just been one function if I wasn't like trying super hard to um, make short functions. So we changed very little and we completely changed the output like this, but it's the same same idea and we use the same data structure to construct, to construct it. So Lua allows you to have very, very flexible stuff. And we only, we, we didn't have to edit more than one template. Um, we didn't have to worry about changing any kind of global variables. Uh, we didn't have to do anything like that. We just went through our code and uh, made a change in like a very localized area to get this different output. And now it is something that you can't do in Cargon easily, I think. Um, oh, I'll go back to, so table.concat is a built-in function. Um, it concatenates the table using whatever separator you specify. So I did comma space as the separator. Um, so um, this, is, this is a much more straightforward output uh, than what we did with the rose band. So, okay, so I guess I'm done now. So are, any questions or anything that you want me to talk about more? No question, but it was very good. Thank you, Megan. Thanks. It was, it was fabulous. Thank you so much. <laughs>